All right, today we're gonna to play some pickleball. See, I'm dressed for it. No, we're not doing that. The light's bothering me, hold on. Bothering my pickleball. This is my new racket. I'm either gonna suck as I usually do or I'm gonna get better, but it becomes an extension of you. And uh, you have to play with the right tools. And where I'm going with this is, even though pickleball is called pickleball and for months I didn't play it because it's called pickleball. What's going on in that court? It's actually a lovely game full of lovely people and you make fast friends, but it's actually a chess match. You have to think three moves ahead. I swear, when you get really into it, the shot you take is really the shot you're gonna take. Once, if he or she misses or does the shot the way you want them to, like you hit it to their left side and their righty, you know that ball is coming back weekly, so you're thinking about the next shot after that. Gee, where has a stellar and sterling young attorney preached always be three steps ahead? Here, in these videos. Well, today's the big boy. Why am I dressed in my pickleball outfit? Just kidding. I'm going to trial, and so are you. So, this video, under the auspices of educational, informational, and somewhat entertainment, is given to show you how to be a better trial attorney if you wish to use my stuff. Uh, that's on you, you be you. Um, I am dressed like I dress for trial. Look at the colors. Blue, the color of trust. I believe, and I've been told many times, a very inclusive tie. Think about that. All are welcome. All can trust me. Look at the hair, it's gray. I used to color the hair because I thought that's, I wanted to be younger and blah, blah, blah. Juries like gray hair. Who'd have knew that you could actually get older and still be loved, at least in my head. So we're going to trial today and we're gonna need water because I'm already dry. My, I gotta, I've i been practicing and I'm on fire right now so I figured I better get in front of the camera rather than my usual sluggish slow self. Oh, there it is right there. So, hey look, this is probably gonna go a while. It's gonna give 50 minutes to an hour. I'm sorry about that. And maybe, and that's good. You got 30 years, as I always do, I point to my head for our podcast members. I point to my head and go, 30 years, I try to do in 30 minutes. I can do it on anything, man. But this is gonna go longer. I can just tell and smell it. Um, so I'm gonna be drinking a lot of water. Hey look, here we go. I'm gonna tell you an expert story for my first trial. One of the biggest things that you have trouble with is whether it's a deposition or trial is gonna be your expert. You try to fry them in a deposition and you also set yourself up for a good trial if you do it right. But uh, the word expert <laughs> is a standalone word, meaning when you're considered an expert, you're in a small exclusive club, exclusive club, and those aren't in that club, look at the expert. Well, he's the expert. Have you heard that before? Hey, you're the expert. It is a position, again, of trust that we can trust that guy. So how you battle that is you have your own expert. And in law school, in evidence is one of the first times I heard this. Cases ultimately are won or lost in a battle of the experts be that the attorneys or the actual experts, but here's my philosophy on experts. Knock them down. <laughs> I know I sound adversarial when I say that, but you have to be an idiot trial attorney to win sometimes. And I'm, I'm the guy in the room, okay? That's my head. I'm going to knock that guy down. How do you do that? I'm going to tell you how I did that as a first time, maybe 32 year old attorney going to try not knowing Jack. If you fit those, that description, or you've been doing this 10, 20, 30 years, I hope this is good for you. If you've been doing this 10, 20, 30 years, you'll know exactly what I'm saying. And maybe you'll know it better than I'm not saying enough, but I'm gonna give you the rudimentary approach to doing this with a, an expert story, which will hopefully run through the theme 
Hold on to that word theme, please. Just remember the word theme. So I'm in my first trial and I've said, talked about this before. It's a Lemon Law case. And my guy has gone through five transmissions in his 1993 probe, used car. It's a used car case. It's worth, at the time, maybe $12,000. Today it's worth $36,000. Um, and the accusation from the other side and why it goes to trial, remember, no good cases go to trial. That's Unless you're asking for millions, no good cases go to trial. And, you know, if it's going to go to trial, I'm sure judges would love an exciting sterling, but no good cases go to trial as far as standing alone on themselves. Maybe there's a political agenda. In this case, Ford wanted to make a, send a message to me because I had so many Ford cases and so many Lemon cases, I was just rocking them back. So they brought in, as, and it still happens to me today, they brought in a big firm, a national firm to crush me. <laughs> and back then that was kind of scary. Today I'm like, oh, it's Wednesday. So um, you are facing a big, bad, Ford financed attorney and I have one client and uh, I'd said in the previous trial this is part two of that video I just stacked the jury with young women because I had a client that was a young man handsome man by the way uh, and it was confirmed at the end of the trial that the jury sent me a note is he married so I did something right. And the other thing I did right, but I didn't do this on my own. The case rest on, I didn't have an expert. The case, they brought in a guy, a mechanic, that was gonna say, yeah, the reason why the probe went through so many transmissions is because, let's say Mr. Smith, my client, revved it high in first and second because he's 21, What this is what kids do, right? And that's reasonable. And I'm sunk. I don't know how to get around that. So the trial was already bad in the first or second day. Judge hated me. I was a new attorney wasting her time with a BS lemon case. Lemon law case. <laughs> Not even new. It was used. But try it. She had to. But she took it out on me. And she was friends with the other side. And she openly was friendly with him. And the, pre the con precondition of everything she said to him was, Jury! And then she'd say, for example, the gentleman that I was opposing that was trying the case for Ford had a hypoglycemia or something. So he had to eat apples or something. She pointed out what he was going through, how tough it was for him. So please don't hold the fact that he's eating an apple in front of you. That's what I had to face. New attorney getting his ass kicked, even by the judge. It hasn't changed, by the way. So... Um, so uh, I'm already doing a bad job, and I've said in the other video, she actually, the judge actually threw a pen or a pencil it, off my head <laughs> during the trial. That happened. So um, it's going from bad to worse. And now I gotta face an expert that I know is gonna testify, and did testify, right before the jury went home with this. Yeah. I'm an expert. I've done thousands of these cases. I work on these cases. I fix these transfers. There's nobody that knows this better. That five transmissions is not a result of a de defect that Ford did. It's because, and only because, he revved it high. And he burned out these transmissions. And he testifies. And the fact that Ford replaced all four transmissions just shows you what a good company Ford is because that guy clearly breached his own warranty by burning out his own transmission. And how dare he sue Ford after they spent thousands of dollars taking care of him when he caused all his own problems. That's what the jury went home with that night. I was sunk. So I went back to the office and luck would have it. <laughs> this is... This is so cool, you're gonna love this. Luck would have it, an old attorney was sitting there doing his old attorney thing. He's probably my age now with the gray hair and everything. And he's like, what's up kid? The other called you kid. 
I said, this is what happened. I'm going to get crushed tomorrow. I'm humiliated. My, everybody's going to hate me, and I have, it's going to be bad tomorrow. I can't go. I can't go tomorrow. He goes, well, what's the problem? And I explain how they're expert, blah, 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 and I don't really know what I'm doing, and I can't rebut it. And he said to me, well, what degree does the expert have? I said, he has a high school degree. Uh, he's a very hardworking mechanic. He's focused on being a mechanic, not going to college. So he said, well, in order to fix these things, right, they can't present to him a doctorate or something that only someone with a graduate degree or even a bachelor's degree can understand. And excuse my, the way I put this, but they have to dumb it down to the mechanics level, any repair on the same level as the guy that's doing the repair. And, and nobody with a graduate de degree or very few are <laughs> fixing cars. I said, yeah, so what? He goes, well, if that guy with a high school degree is reading that stuff and learning how to fix these things, Parker, you have a little bit more education. Just read what he reads. It's not as formidable a task as it appears. You can read what he reads because he's, he's a high school graduate. Nothing, there's anything wrong with that. So it should be easy for you to read and take in what he's saying. And it, the light went off. So I was up all night reading manuals, how to fix a transmission, how to do it right, how to do, what are the causes of transmission burnout? And guess what? This was a unique car. It had a Ford label on it, but the Japanese, and they still do this, they make cars a little differently. They have backups for backups like NASA. And they had this, let's call it a cluster prevention. You could not speed. It was called a rev, a rev protector. So even if someone puts it in first and tries to go 100 miles an hour, the transmission doesn't let you do that. It either stops you, much like when you have a car and you get too close to the car in front of you, it stops you. That's what the transmission did. It was a Japanese Mazda transmission, unlike at the time, an American transmission. And it said there, because I was able to read it, it said, yeah, it has a rev protector. And the mechanic had to have known this. So he lied under oath. He had to know this. What was the, the Ford attorney said, what was the cause of the transmissions? Oh, clearly because he revved it too high in first and second, being a sports young guy, sports guy. But he, he, if he's done all these hundreds of transmissions and he testified, and he had to, the, the other attorney brought it out, and this is exactly what you do. By the way, that's called pushing someone off the limb. If you know that they're going to lie, you build them up and let them get up onto the tree, up onto the limb, and you just push them, push them to the end, knowing that the next answer, they will fall off the limb because they, you pushed them. It's an art, but even I learned how to do it. And I just went back, I couldn't sleep. I wasn't gonna sleep anyway, because I was up all night studying, but I, was, I couldn't wait to get to try to crush this guy. And that's today, I, I can't wait to get to try to crush people in a nice way. <laughs> so, he had to have known about the, the rev protector. He couldn't say that the only cause was the very thing that the rev protector stopped happening. So I did, I got in front of him and I pushed him up. I go, oh, so you're an expert. Oh, great. Tell us about how many of these you've worked on. Oh, at least a thousand or whatever. Oh, great. So you know the ins and outs. There's nothing you don't know. You'll say, yeah, I'm the lead guy. When there's a tremendous transmission, problem. They come to me. There's nothing I don't know about this and your client, blah, 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 blah. And I kept pushing him to the edge and now I've got him on the limb and the limb's starting to get thinner. And I go, oh, okay. So you did all the work on these? Yes. It was clear that he burnt this out. Hmm. Right close to the edge of the limb. And how did this happen? Uh, this happened. He goes, oh, clearly your guy just revved it. I go, hey, uh, one more question. What's a rev protector? It drained out of him. His mouth dropped down. The other attorney, I heard his chair go, move back and stand up. It, it, it just went like silent and slow. 
I, my heart was beating. <laughs> it's doing it to me now. <laughs> Excuse me. He just w fried. He just, he mouth dropped. And he pointed to the other attorney and said, they made me say this. He admitted that he was just there to say whatever they said. He knew what a rev protector is. The car wasn't capable of burning out. It could only burn out by a defect, <clears throat> excuse me, in Ford. And um, <clears throat> so he gave me anything I wanted at that point. I've talked in depositions about how when you set someone up, now they don't want to be in front of you anymore because they're embarrassed. He's got an audience of a judge and the jury and people in the back. They brought in people just to mock me and cheer when I made a mistake, which is a lot. The judge let this freaking happen too. Um, excuse me. The judge's head swiveled and looked at him and she realized she'd backed the wrong horse. <laughs> now, and I see judges do this, she's like, uh, I, speak up please, Mr. Parker just asked you a question. <laughs> She's suddenly my best friend, and dude, that's that's what happens. Um, he's like, oh, and he knew he was my, I owned him then. I go, oh, so you're saying they told you to lie? Yes. Did um, my client do anything wrong? He did not do anything wrong. So the rep protector would have protected all this, even though you testified. He said, they made me testify. I said, what do you think is the problem that really happened. He goes, it's clearly a defect in the Ford product, blah, 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 blah. The Ford should have taken care of this. Ford blew it, blew, blew. The jury just, it's probably the only time they were really not paying attention and, and salivating over my client. And they're like, they got it. They all got what had happened. It's like a Perry Mason moment. And it's a heroin hit. It's the first time a, a, a guy does heroin. From then on, he's chasing that high. It's called chasing the dragon. For trial attorneys, it's a Perry Mason moment. You're chasing that. You, we all know that. Even lawyers, non-lawyers know that Perry Mason moment. It's the greatest thing. We won that trial because I took on an expert just using their own material. And so that's key. Um, that's a kind of a tip. If your expert is going to testify, know the freaking thing better than him. Again, I've said this before, but I'm stealing from somebody else. Know your enemy better than you know yourself. And I butchered that. And if your enemy is the expert, which he really clearly was when the jury went to bed, he was my friend in the morning. In that case, we won that. It was my first ever trial. Jury loved, uh, the judge loved me. Hi, Mr. Parker, all of a sudden. And the, all the people they brought in, gone. It was just the gentleman on his own now who was eating an apple. <laughs> and no one gave it beep. So that's how you take on an expert. That's how, what's one of the ways, and that's how you turn an, a bad situation into a good situation. So how do you try a case? Um, I, I wanna go into the getting in exhibits. I might touch upon it at a later time, but getting in exhibits I think it's going to muddy the waters and already I'm going to be boring. So I'm not going to get there really. Your first thing you have to do is establish a theme. What is your theme? You have to have a theme. Then the theme, I'm going to do this backwards, but forwards. Your theme then becomes the genesis or the basis of your opening statement, which becomes your closing statement. So your theme is the beginning and the end. Your theme is a promise to the jury that you're gonna say and prove something. And when you come in with that closing statement, that should be your theme, supported by your opening statement, that is supported by the proof of each part of the opening statement that you proved. And the closing statement, it's easy. You already did it. The opening statement, and in a smaller level, your theme has done all the work for you. So you could do a five-day trial on one line. You're not doing that. It's a theme. And it's 
a seed, but you've got a big tree to present. That's the limb analogy again. So you can only get a theme after you've done the hard work preparing for a trial. Here's why. I, every trial attorney will tell you this. Uh, if you try three cases a year and that's all you do, he, he or she is not going to say that. Also not going to play racquetball like me. This is my racquetball outline. Anyway, I said that. Um, when you get ready for a trial, you learn more about the case than you ever did. Looking over the same thing 64 times, which is part of the hard work, suddenly there's the thing that you didn't even realize. You'd skipped over it. It's just the way it is. The harder you work, the luckier you get. And you'll find, you'll find nuggets. So never write a theme until you've done the hard work because the theme has to incorporate and encompass and represent everything you know about that case because surprises are not an option. Surprises kill cases and themes. So do really hard work of reading and knowing the case law and knowing the other side. Know the other side's case better than you know your own. And I've said before, when I do depositions and the other side's not even objecting to things, I'll object for them. I'll just, it's just, you not, I'm trying to represent their client too. So pick a theme once you've done the work, but surprises kill cases so there should be no surprises or a smoking gun or for the ford case i just mentioned the surprise was nobody told the attorney about the uh, rev protector surprise and look how it killed their case so the way you get rid of surprises is to know theirs and your cases backwards and forwards a surprise kills the jury's trust of you. You can wear all the blue you want, but if you have a surprise and it contradicts or changes your theme, goodbye case, there's room to rehab. And we've talked about rehab in another way, but surprises, know your shit back and forth because surprises kill cases. All right? A word on preparing a trial. Believe it or not, the harder you prepare for a trial, the easier and more likely a case will settle. There's a cosmic force that if you don't put the time in, generally, will, you'll end up in trial unprepared. So there's many reasons, the harder you work, the luckier you get. There's a cosmic force that wants to propel you to where you want to go. You may be believing that God is putting you in a test, that maybe you want to be tested uh, to improve your mettle. But unless you do the hard work, you're not settling the case and you're going to trial. But if you've done the hard work, if you go to trial, you're ready. Um, most good cases, as I said, don't make it to trial. So learn the cases that support you. Learn everything you need to know about the expert's job, which I did not. I'm telling you that. It's a great story, but I should have known what that expert's book was all about and how they did their job. Well, I'm a big believer. You learn more from mistakes than you do success. I succeeded, but my mistake was the thing. And you better believe I know everything about, if there's an expert involved, what they're gonna talk about, and I'll try to know it better than them. If you're an attorney or a smart person watching this, or a regular person, you're already way ahead of the game. Just put your good God-given talents to work, man. They're all in here but we want to watch this game or play this game or just, and don't leave it up to chat GPT to do the work. It doesn't work. If you don't do the work, you won't get lucky. You can't half-ass this stuff. I should have said what I meant to say, but you can't half-ass it. It just works when you work. You can't half-ass it. Um, Ideally, it would be lovely if you just take, that was my ultimate goal, it still is, to just take maybe five cases a year, really big ones. It's not my job to police the world or help everybody, but I feel like I'd leave people on the lurch 
for, that need help that I can help very quickly if I just did three cases a year. Um, my point I really want you to get from my meanderings is when you do the hard work, you see the case and the fruits from that hard work so much better. So find a way to do the hard work and then create your theme. Okay, I always try to add some eccentricities and I always trip up on that word. Um, I like to tell you what makes me crazy, but the crazy I lean into and I use it to win cases. And um, this is gonna be, uh, this is gonna be, I hope you don't wanna cart me off and two guys are gonna come in in white coats and big nets and that's the last you see of me. But I fantasize about everything. Meaning, if I'm gonna be doing a witness or an expert, whoever it is, I fantasize about the thing actually happening and what he or she's gonna say and what I'm gonna say. It's all fantasy. But when I'm done, I'm taking notes and I'm really, I've seen conversations in trials that I have already seen before. I know that makes me sound like a crazy person. I'm telling you trial attorneys are not the sanest people. Why else would you want to be in public speaking where all eyes on you? All eyes on me. Sorry about that. Um, you've got to be a positive motivation speaker. Why? Because positive motivation speakers visualize where they want you to go. They'll say, hey, visualize, put a thing on the fridge, do not eat, or put a thing on your wall, where you wanna be five years from now. Visualize where you wanna be. And that is what you do with trial work. You can do the whole trial in your head before you get there. It's crazy man's material, but don't do trial work if you're sane. <laughs> if you were sane, and it's a catch-22, you would not do trial work. If you're insane, where you should not be in front of a trial because of all the triggers, you would do trial work. So we live, crazy people like me live through triggers all day long. The thing is though, once I'm in that element, all my craziness is rewarded. There's no triggers for me. I'm at ease. I can't wait to freaking get in there and hammer somebody or something. There's no, and I'm a little bit much, but I get the job done, I think. Um, to get through um, arguments with the judge, acting like a crazy person is not gonna help you. But knowing your case, but knowing the case law. Uh, so I visualize an argument with a judge. I hope this means something for you, but I visualize, hey, you can't bring that in Parker because he didn't do X, Y, Z. So I'll go find a case that says, yes, you can. And that'll be part of my preparation the trial notebook. As I said before, a trial attorney has the same dog-eared trial notebook that he or she just conforms to that case and facts. But if you're like me and you have a vein or a similarity in all the cases you trial or focus on, it's the same stuff. If there's a new case, you put it in there. That's preparation. Do not depend on that book, at least in the jury's eyes or anybody else's eyes, when you are at the podium. I just, that's me. There may be a, attorneys that say, yeah, but I have this happened or I bang my head and if I don't have this, I'm, all right, good. And I've, in the past, I've kind of mocked people like that. But I'm not up there to do an average job. I'm there to win. And I'm not there to mock people, but if you don't know it by heart, you're not doing you, the jury. You don't want the jury to know your stuff without the preparation that you just put into it, right? So talk to them and sell them without reading into a book that they're not gonna have. So I just think being handcuffed to a trial book is not the way to go. And I'll, I'll tell you the podium story real quick because I'll forget it. You know, every time I ask you to remind me about the story, you never do. So I'm gonna, no, I'm just kidding again. Here's the podium story. So I'm in federal court, podium, podium. He, federal court is well-funded. so. He has his own podium to present to the jury. I have my own podium. And the most you're gonna do, sometimes the attorney will turn to the jury and make themselves comfortable. But you know what? They're behind a podium. <laughs> um, 
that doesn't appeal to me. If I'm in a jury and there's a guy hiding 75% of his body, in my head, you're hiding something. And maybe he's not. But that's also a security blanket. They're not in front of a podium or behind one. So I make a big deal when he goes up and does his thing and moves the podium but stays there. When it's my turn, I go up, I get, I move it, I go, you know what? I'm not doing this. And I announce stupid stuff like that. And I push the podium away. And I go right up like this. And I'm person to person. I think person to person is better than podium to person. Maybe that's just me. But it's just one of those things that adds on to what you need. And that's acceptance. Remember, crazy person, we want approval. But acceptance of you is acceptance of your clients. Is acceptance, this guy's hiding behind a podium. <laughs> I'll even say that. Now he's got to come out from behind the podium, which he does not want to do. Why? Well, one of the reasons he's got the book. So I've seen guys do this. They're leaning over the podium, but they're trying to be Brian Parker-ish. Not because of anything great, but they, as a trial attorney, you, you think you don't let any stern stone go on. Meaning, he did this, I got to answer this. He did this, I got There's a balancing of the equities in every aspect of the law. And I've talked about this even into the nitty gritty of preemptories. When do I pick somebody else? If I can stop him from using a preemptory, blah, 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 should I do this? And again, there is these magicians that have, and I may not, I didn't probably finish my thought, but I think trying a case are these magical people that have like five or six poles they spin plates on each, and they're constantly spinning because if they don't keep spinning, one plate's gonna fall. That's a trial, man. There are spinning plates waiting to crash. And you've gotta do this. I gotta, the jury, what's the jury doing? Is my client paying attention or is he picking his nose? Do I have the right case law? Oh, I've gotta get that closing statement. I gotta fill in. It's a nightmare. But if you're crazy, like me, who's ADHD, it's just, uh, it's, like I said, it's just a Wednesday to me. <laughs> I got monitors and things coming at me and three phones. It's uncomfortable, but for trial work, it's work. And for trial work, the number one, another number one or 1A thing is to know the elements of your claim. Most debt collection claims are based upon what's called an account state stated statute. Every statute's got one. Every statute's got one you must know the elements and you write down the elements. So a plaintiff is suing your client for a debt. The elements are going to be all the same throughout the, the nation. Establish a relationship between the creditor or the debt buyer and your client. Was there an agreement? Usually there isn't because it's a, it's a debt buyer. So they, they bought it for pennies on a dollar and the creditor didn't give them the stuff. So they have to have an implied agreement that's allowed or an express or implied promise to make a payment with an agreement that the debt is made. That's pretty much the elements of Florida and Michigan and probably everywhere else. Uh, use of the card or the loan or distribution of the funds is like an example and proof that clearly there was a contract between the parties. So, but if you can get a no in any of those elements, you win the case. The plaintiff that's suing your client has to prove all three or four things to win their case. All you're looking for is, a, is one, jur, jur, you know, you're looking for one element to not be proven. You must know that going in because you've done the work. Um, but you want to put those elements that your side's supposed to put up and go, did this happen? No. Did this happen? And honesty is good. So if did this happen? Well, I got to admit to you, jury, that did happen. Juries, I think, would respect if you were honest and didn't admit. Some people go, never admit anything. I don't agree with that because we're human beings and we make mistakes. We want second chances. There's all sorts of human conditions that help you here. So if you admit, yeah, my guy did that. Because the overwhelming statement to the court, to the jury, to anybody else that listens is, Yes, I owe the debt. I just don't owe it to these people. 
And that's usually true. They can't prove it because if they bought the debt pennies on the dollar, see my video on how to beat a debt collection lawsuit. Excuse me. So if you have a defense that says, I don't owe the debt because of identity theft, you knocked out an element. I did not use the credit card or receive any funds. You knocked out an element. This whole thing's about burden of proof. The other side has the burden of proof. That's a tough hill to climb. And that's why I always tell clients, and I also tell clients something else, but if you get sued, it's better than not being sued. But how could that be? Because they just added extra burdens to make you prove you owe the debt. And they also opened up the door by suing you that if you win that lawsuit, you don't owe anything because most creditors will come, hey, look, you owe five, pay us a thousand, blah, 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 blah. But you could knock out the whole thing. And that is a burden on top of the creditor. He or she has to prove the burden of proof. Make, they have a burden of proof. That's in America. However, with the account stated statute in most states, if they add an affidavit to their lawsuit, the burden of proof jumps to the poor defendant now to prove he doesn't owe it. It's assumed that he owes the debt. It's just a matter of how much does he owe now. So I have my clients do a counter affidavit. If you go to collectionstopper.com, podcast plus, all my answers against so many plaintiffs are right there. Every single one has an has a affidavit. Just remember, you're going to have to prove that affidavit at trial. So don't say it unless it's the truth. Have your client sign it. Let them know that don't sign it unless it's the truth, obviously. But again, uh, a defense of ID theft, statute of limitations. Someone else signed up and then died. What does that mean? I have cases where the wife, husband, died after signing up and running up the credit card, they sue her because she was living in the same house. And even when a lot of times they can show, hey, you used the card, therefore you're liable. That's not an obligation. Um, you may owe the debt even in the worst case scenario, but if you don't owe it to a debt by six transfers down the road. So there's lots of defenses. But I've had this happen with judges and juries. It's a large hump to say, yeah, I owe it, but I don't owe it to them. In a way, it's almost like you're getting away with something. And you know what? We all would want to get away with something if we were the defendant, but you come a, become a juror. It's a very, don't kid yourself. Juries are human. So, and we all kind of look down our noses at this, even though we're doing the same thing. It's the best way I can put that. So you've got to take them over this hump. He said he owed it. Yeah, but he doesn't owe it to them. What does that mean? Your job right then, it's a tough one, is to show why he doesn't owe it. And now you've got to explain assignments and affidavits. So <laughs> it's, it's a large hero of the climb that you can beat and win easily if you do the hard work. Hard work, hard work, hard work. The harder you work, the luckier you get. These cases are all settled or won on the burden of proof. I settle 99% of my cases just on the burden of proof. Uh, the account stated statute, at least in Michigan, again, as I said, is sued with an affidavit. It's the, it was a Republican legislature that created this to help debt buyers and debt collectors not have to bring the original contract in. There's even, they even wrote a statute <laughs> that debt buyers will say, uh, the rule is, especially in Florida, you've got to have the contract to claim someone own, is breached a contract. The, stitch, the legislature in Michigan created a law or a statute that says, if you don't have it, but you allege in the complaint that the guy had it, that's enough. You don't have to add it to the um, complaint, which normally you would in a breach of contract case. I believe that's MCR 2.113F. 
I hope I'm right about that. <laughs> um, so make sure that affidavit, my point being, stands up to scrutiny it in a deposition. And if it does, it'll stand up to scrutiny at trial. Uh, make sure it's truthful. Uh, if you can write the words, I dispute this debt into an affidavit, that goes a long way. Judges and juries want to hear you dispute or don't owe, or have a damn good reason why you're not paying a debt you claim you do owe. Um, but just not to these guys. Depositions are mini trials, and it's a chance for you to ferret out whether you have good or bad evidence, good or bad case. Or, frankly, if the other side has a quality attorney. If you know, and you should, the warts of your case and the other side doesn't get, doesn't figure it out, I'm thinking, take this take case to trial. I'm going to murder that guy. Um, obviously, I'm not going to murder the guy. But what I do, and I think it's important if you're going to do trial work, is go to my video on how to protect your client in the deposition and the rule of five discussion. Remember, I did this a lot. The rule of five stops your story from getting out. Some attorneys go, well, how are you supposed to show them you got a good case? Again, we balance the equities. Do we want the story out in a deposition so that when we get to trial, suddenly there are five witnesses saying, that's not how it happened because they know <laughs> your story or opinion or what you perceive as your facts. So the rule of five protects the story from getting out. It becomes a surprise. Remember we use that word surprise? If they get surprised, you're going to win that case. The bigger the surprise, the bigger the win. So that's another reason why the rule of five works in a deposition preparation. They get surprised when your client says, oh yeah, the guy said that I could not pay the bill. And the guy's like, what? And he's looking at his client, why did you say that? I didn't, well, he didn't ask the right question. So the attorney sucks, frankly. That, I'm like, yeah, I'll take this to trial. That means something to me. Um, you know what, you can be like me. I'm an average person and a brain and an attorney, but I really work hard, too much. I have no life, no quality of life. Um, that makes up for innate intelligence. And again, I think really smart people are chat GPT. They don't do the work. It's just like lifting. I lift. I'm not a big guy, but I'm muscle bound. There's no fat on me because I lift all the time. And I, you ha but I have to do the work because I don't have good genes, muscle building genes. But if you do the hard work, you will get the brain muscles. Um, it's, if I find a good attorney, I also kind of want to go to trial. It's just like pickleball to me. Da -da. The better players elevate your game. So once in a while, you'll come across someone that's done the work or is really smart. And I can still win against that person because I know they're not doing the work at trial because they'll just their brain, but if they do the work and are very smart, I'm scared of that person and it elevates my game. And I love elevating my game because once I go to a place that an attorney or an opponent brings me to, I'm always gonna be at that level now. And now I'm gonna look for another guy to get me into the next level. And I'm gonna be a better attorney and clients are gonna be happier with me. I won my first trial, like I told you about the expert case, against a very experienced litigator that had the judge on his side uh, and certain people making up certain things on their side. Um, I'm going to give you some Parker facts. In my estimation, 70% of a win or loss of trial are the facts of the case. Good facts trump everything. 20% is likability of your client you represent. I've lost a trial believing it was my cause, problem, and then somebody out in the parking lot says, yeah, yeah, you, you were right, but I just didn't like that guy, your client. I had that happen. They also, as I've said in previously, even though the judge tells them and I make motions, tell them, don't talk to the attorneys, and the attorneys aren't jerks or anything. They're just not allowed to, you know, that's a breach of, 
of there's you they could be found that you're influencing the the jury in any shape or form so i make a motion during trial please at the beginning please tell the jury that i am going to be ignoring them and i think in the the video i did i said like a crazy person i'm actually going to walk by them like this <laughs> it's not because parker's crazy although he is it's because he doesn't want to influence or be accused of influencing. So please, judge, tell them Parker's a good guy. He's not ignoring you because he's an a-hole. Um, but they're still, my point is, they're still in the parking lot during a trial. I've had guys run up to me. and They right, ran hard to get to me. Mr. Parker, you're doing a great job. And when you brought that in, or why is your client blah, blah, blah. I'd, I'm like, I can't talk to you. And they're sc not scared of a judge at all. Just will just this will happen all the time. So you got to be very careful and get your judge to protect you in that way. Um, but juries do the darndest things. Uh, Five percent of a trial success is you. Five percent. Don't kid yourself. The facts can win a case. That five percent can be th at the right time. All right. So you've got to do a a hard, a lot of hard work for 5% of the influence. There are attorneys that are just theatrical. You, you see them uh, in the news that just by their name they win cases or, or their flair. I, I had a father-in-law that I knew I could beat, but his voice, it just gave you trust. He had a great trial voice. And I recognize that. And he, hopefully he did too. But I, he wasn't all that smart. I, I, but that voice, and you want to listen to him, and he told good stories. It's still only 5%, but it, he probably ratcheted up to 10% because he had a good voice. But remember, the harder you work, the luckier you get, and everything else will take care of itself. You can increase your 5% influence and steal from other percentages by doing the hard work because you can find out more facts and rob from that 70% that facts and maybe even support the facts. So you're down to 2.5%. In other words, if you can just present a case, the facts, and here's it is, you take the pressure off yourself and it's just gonna slide in and do the work itself. That's all right. I don't really wanna be having people think, yeah, you won that case because if I lose the case, did I lose the case? So I'm pretty even killed in that regard. I'll influ uh, influence it with hard work. Um, I've told you how to knock the ass down, <laughs> knock an expert down, and knock his ass way down either. I did it at trial, I didn't do it in a depth, but if you can do it in a depth, know the experts. Okay, so they're in rarefied air. They're an expert of this small thing and you're not, but because it's this small thing, there's the ability of you to go learn that. If they knew everything, <laughs> good luck getting ready for trial, getting up to date with everything, but they're not, they're experts. So you can out expert the expert by knowing his stuff. When you know your stuff as well as he or she does, they'll, they're pretty neutral and benign people, experts. They're engineers, they're locked in boxes. They'll tell you, hey, how'd you know that? Or, hey, yeah, you're right. They have no friends generally. The mechanic guy, he wasn't in that place. He was an expert just because he'd worked on the most transmissions at that dealership. So there's many people just like him, but real experts you can out expert and they won't give you a hard time about that because in a way they have egos, man. They have expert egos. So by you learning their stuff, that ego pleasing overcomes any one-sidedness. They become neutral and into you because you respected them. Their own attorney is not gonna know their stuff because you know what their own attorney is gonna do? He's like, oh good, I don't have to do the work because he'll do all the work. So if you do the work, again, that's the harder the work, the, you luck, the harder you work, the luckier you get. The expert, remember I talked about turning around the witness, so in my deposition, that now you're their 
reversing the roles because you're so good and their guy sucks, they'll rely on you. I've had that happen where other the other side's guy is represented, but he'll go, well, Mr. Parker, how do you think I should handle I mean, show them the hard work, the experts. They love that. Um, so you've got your theme. What do you do with that theme? You put it in your opening statement. That's in a statement to the jury. This case is about X, Y, Z. And you already done the hard work. You're not gonna get surprised or tripped up by announcing that. So that goes into your opening statement. Have a list, one sheet paper, don't have a book, that has five or 10 things that you need to prove to win the case. It may be two things. If you're just looking to knock out one element, you may need to prove three things. Have a space, have a box. When you prove that thing, check it, write down what, how you prove that, move on to the next one. In a lot of my videos, you'll hear, and it works in life, it works in taking the bar, it ter works in terms of stressful situations where time is not an option. You've got limited time and you've got to keep those plates in the air. Because, okay, this one's spinning, now I got to do this. If you spend all the time trying to get this one perfect, these others are going to fall. So this is what I always tell you. Hit it and move on. Once you've got it, be secure. I know I told you the story about the guy that took the bar and spent 20 minutes on, on one question because he just wasn't he knew one was right and one was right and he, he, he ate up all the time he needed. You had like 10 seconds per question. You did, you hit it and move on. Once you've proven your thing, trust yourself. Move on to the next one. Check mark when you prove it, hit it and move on. And if there are exhibits to prove what you have proven, do the jury a favor, remind them. You remember we talked to Joe Smith and he said X, Y, Z. And then he, Joe Smith had the document that proved it. They will love you for this because you're helping them win for you and remind them if they haven't taken notes. And it may be the first time they have to pay attention either in your opening or your closing statement. So if it's, and I was talking more in terms of closing, remind them of what the opening statement said. And all throughout, theme, opening statement, closing statement, that's a promise you're making to the jury. I'm going to prove my theme and my facts to your satisfaction. Your first statement to the jury, after you've said to them, ladies and gentlemen, I recognize that this is a sacrifice on your part. You've spent five days here. You've got families. You've got jobs. Uh, and, and, and there's one thing I want to tell you, jury. If I've done anything in my passion and my zeal to offend you in any way, let me apologize to you because I do recognize the civic duty that you have. We all have. I'm an immigrant and I love this country. And that is just a minimum of what I want to do for this country. And you've done it today. You've done more than me. Thank you for your service. But if I've done anything to upset you or my passion has been a little overwhelming because I'm a little overwhelming, Jerry, I apologize. But please don't hold it to my client that's just here trying to keep his head above water. Is that pretty good or what? So that's your closing statement. Now you go into why they can love me some Brian Parker and some client here. And they will love you for it if you just make it easy to do their job. And if you've repeated, 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 they'll use that, especially if you're talking, and pick a person who you're talking to in the jury, if you're talking to the foreman, Mm, you're talking to the foreman with that stuff. So you've created a trial book from your hard work, but don't bring that out. Speak from the heart. Move the podium. Here's a little tip. I wasn't going to do this, but I'll tell you. You don't have to do this. I'm a child, okay? So, but when I'm done with my closing statement, which is an accumulation of your theme, ways that you've proven your case, and the elements that have been killed. It's that simple. Your theme and opening statement 
is your closing statement. Maybe take a couple of minutes to add some stuff, but all the work and the plates have been sp kept spinning. Okay, so now I've spoken to the jury. <laughs> I'll say to the jury, now he's gonna come and tell you why it's perfectly okay to shit all over this guy <laughs> or something like that. I mean, that's how he has to take the podium now. He's accused of just crapping all over this guy and killing his dog. Now he's gonna come and tell you why killing his dog is perfectly acceptable in this great country of ours. And he's not being very respectful of this poor man and his diabetes. I mean, you, you just want to work things. So now maybe you said the right way and the right thing, so it taints his whole thing. And if you're a magician with words, and you kind of know how he's going to come in and he's going to use certain words, use those same words to say, now he's going to come in and say, suppression of the credit uh, trade line was fine, so what, he lost his job. He's going to be using the word suppression, and every time he does, they're going to think, hey, he cost him his job with that suppression. I don't know what it is, but that guy doesn't have a job now. So if you do the hard work, you can... To the, you can be a hard ass. You're there to win. You're not there to hope. <laughs> you get an average outcome, and you're saying the truth. He's gonna stand up. He's gonna crap all over that guy and claim that the suppression of the trade line didn't cost him his security clients with the FBI. <laughs> That's all they hear: suppression, suppression. So the trial notebook, while useful, don't have it in front of you. If you have in front of you in my trial, I'm gonna focus and have the jury focus on that. And I'm gonna want the jury to eventually say, why is he reading from the book? Because I'm gonna say that. I'm gonna do stupid stuff like the one sheet of paper once I've memorized it. You know what, I'm gonna to speak to you from my heart. So it's clowny trial stuff, but this is where we're at. You should live and breathe just one page. That's your opening statement list. Again, produce a list with check boxes. By the way, I, I gotta explain the glasses. <laughs> the glasses are there to make me look like I'm intelligent. <laughs> I need them, by the way. And I'm reading a lot, which I tell you not to do, but there's a ton here. But uh, I'm adding the, I always add the glasses. Um, you should live and breathe your opening statement because it's, the breath that you breathe into the closing statement, where you bring your theme through the closing statement to, through the opening statement to the closing statement and remind them again, you'll remember jury, I said this case is about, and say to them, I promise you, I promise you, and you may wanna even say this, promise is kept, here's why. It is theatrical. But um, you're there to win, not to hope that you win. You can only control what you can control. So control what you can control. Do the hard work and the, the expansion of what you control will just grow larger and larger. If you work hard enough, and that goes to my point of knowing their case, you can dominate the whole trial. If you get an opportunity when the other side said something and it's wrong, and you in front of the jury go, no, I think he meant to help his client, and you're helping their client, why would you do that? Because it's credibility, Mwah! Credibility is part of the evidence rules. What's the credibility of this thing you're bringing in? But it's also in the mind of the jurors. I could trust this guy. Hell, he was trying to help them, and he did something that hurts his own case, but he's honest. He has credibility with me. So if there's a touch and go thing, they're gonna go my way. Know your case, know their case. It produces credibility, compatibility. It eliminates anxiety. If you can do your case from a sheet of paper, who the hell walks around with a trial book? Nobody. Think about this. We don't even walk around with notes, so get away from your notes. Be theatrical about it. Talk to people like they, because then you're one of them. 
And I've talked about one of my favorite things is when you're doing a witness, you're examining a witness or you're doing a cross, stand next to the jury. Like it's the 13 of us, because there's alternates and all this stuff. Well, tell us what you meant by that. It's not tell the jury or tell me, although that's a, an approach. I like them to think I'm part of them and they're part of me. So there's all this, all this stuff you can do. But I'd have to say with that opening and closing, hit it and move on. We're in an hour now and I've got more to say, but I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do a 10-ish minute version of what I just did. And I'm doing that now with all my videos. I just did one, how to take on LVNV funding. And then I did a 10 minute. Hey, here, and you can go to the big one. I think this is, the length is pretty good as far as it's chock full of information. Take it or leave it. But I'll have my 10 minute version too. Remember your closing statement really is your opening statement. If there's been surprises, you got to address that. If there are surprises, you didn't do the work. There shouldn't be any, it should mirror your opening statement with how stuff came in. Your closing statement closes this as to your theme and you show that promises made, promises kept. Take the jury through the opening statement checklist. Show them why you've proven or killed an element. All you got to do is kill one element. Use your podium. By the way, that crazy stuff I do with the podium or the empty seat stuff I mentioned before. Sometimes defendants and their attorneys don't show up. Because they know the other defendant, let's say there's a couple of defendants, a couple of, is going that day and there's no point. I'll point that out to the jury. Hey man, you showed up and then you point to an empty seat and go, why isn't Mr. Smith and his client here? Is your time not as important? Well, never mind. But you gotta ask yourself, jury, why are you going his way when he can't even show up? <laughs> this is what you do. So use your podiums, use your empty seats. Use your, and now Mr. Smith is gonna take, is gonna tell you why my guy should have suffered a broken leg. It was his own fault. It's not, you know, now that's three weird stuff. You'll have your own weird stuff. And I'm gonna say something that most of you aren't gonna listen to me about. You've got weird stuff up here that doesn't work on the street, but it works in a trial. If we're entertainers and most entertainers, oh, he's a great guy, Tom Hanks, Tom Cruise, this guy, that guy whoever it is, but uh, the, your best comedians are shitstorms. They're so deranged, but their comedy is born out of how, der, how upset or hurt or damaged they are suffering from trauma. The more trauma laden a comedian is, the funnier it is. And, it's, and again, celebrities aren't who they, we think they are. I saw him on the Green Mile and he was so nice to that guy. That's not Tom Hanks, right? Well, it's an act up there, but they are not really acting. They're relying on this trauma inside of them to make fun of a situation because maybe they were beaten all the time and all they had is their comedy. Maybe they were small and were suffered from bullying. All they had is their comedy or they had to pretend they love someone to, so that the dad wouldn't beat them. That's trauma giving you tools to get through life. It's not healthy, but they, actors, comedians, whomever, found a way to monetize their trauma. That's what I do. I'm a quirky mess, but inside the courtroom, I'm on stage, man, and I get to use my weirdness. My point is I'm not telling you, I'm actually telling you how, how messed up I am. So I'm not trying to get your approval or anything. Yes, I am. But I want you to lean into your mess. It gives you, because you're laden with these things. I'm laden with them. But in trial, I get to be the man and use the weirdness. 
And it's a relief. It takes away the anxieties of that weirdness. Well, you've got some weirdness. I, I, I say how you've got these innate tools. You do. You've got some really good skills. I swear you do. The first time you convinced your parents to get you that book you wanted, or that iPad, or all the phone, you became a trial attorney. Think about that. So you do have the skills. You all have the skills. You also have some weirdness. <laughs> so use the weirdness. Don't, I'm not afraid to be in front of a, I've been in front of some major players. It didn't bother me in the least. It just doesn't. And so I can take that in front of a jury and make fun of this guy. And I like to go where no man goes. Almost cr like, oh my God, he said what? But it does, makes me successful. I'm using the trauma to my client's benefit and for everybody's benefit. Probably not really for my own, but that's another day. While you're waiting for the, I'm gonna end this because I'm a mess. While you're waiting for the jury to come in, I cried at the beginning of this video. Anyway, while you're waiting for the jury to come in, bring a book. It's annoying as hell to sit there and waiting. And what you start doing while you're waiting you start buddying up to people and what do you think the jury says and what is it? The first thing you'll hear out of somebody's mouth is, hey, if they take limited time to come back, we're going to win. Or if they take a long time, we're going to win. None of that stuff is true. You're talking about human beings that either make mistakes or uh, here's, here's a, a great example of jury deliberations. I did an arbitration panel. I, there may have been three people. So we were in a room. How do I announce this? I was in a room. One of the walls of that room where the arbitration panel sat and we presented to, the walls were also the hallway. So you walked by a wall of the arbitration room, come around, go in a door and now you're in the arbitration room that is framed by at least one wall in a hallway. So I sat there waiting for the arbitration panel to deliberate and we're going through the usual exercises. So I bring a book or bring something, bring work. Don't engage in these discussions that just weird you out. Did I do this right? You've done it, that's another thing. Hit it and move on. If you want an hour of anxiety, whether you're won or lost, or did you get this in it, it's not going to change anything. And believe me, I've been there 30 years of that shit, where you question yourself. You always forget something. And maybe you didn't, unless you're reading your transcript. So bring a book. Bring. Don't get into this negative Nancy stuff with the other guy that he's got his own stuff he's putting on you. Get away from people. Nothing you do from that point on changes anything. You did your best. That's all you can do. Which is not said by me because doing your best isn't good enough. Go beyond that. Do the hard work. Uh, and then if you lose, you know <laughs> there's nothing more. You, you left it all in the field. So I did the, dibble, I did the arbitration. There's three arbitrators. He said, I said, we all, couple hours, now get out of here, you two, we're gonna decide this case. We sit down, he, the other attorney starts going through the, hey, do you think they're gonna take a long time, you're gonna take a short time, I've got my book. Some people just don't get nonverbal stuff. And I can't take it anymore, I have to leave. So I leave, I come around the same way I came in, and I start going down the hallway, past the wall where the arbitrators are deliberating and I hear them say, yeah, we're going to go for the plaintiff here. And the other one says, yeah, but we can't just do it right off the bat. We're getting paid three twenty an hour or whatever. All right. So let's talk about, and they started going into the, you can't not hear it. I'm not trying to hear it. They made the decision in two minutes. They took about an hour and a half to come back and they just wasted time back there. So there's all sorts of things that go in a jury room. This wasn't a jury room or protected or anything, and I wasn't trying to listen. 
don't try to think that you know it. The minute someone says to you, oh, when they take a long time, blah, 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 get out of there. You're already quirky and nervous and anxiety ridden enough about the job you did. You don't need a negative Nancy getting in your grill. I try to say in your grill in every video. So what happens after you win or you lose? I'm really closing this now, but it is, I just remembered I should say something. There is a school of thought that you poll the jury. The judge will tell the jury at the end. Uh, the attorneys want to ask you some questions. And some people run the heck out of there. They don't want to talk to them. And five days. But some will let you ask them, right? I don't know what to tell you. If I lose a case and I've lost, I don't want anything to do with the jury. I'm mad as hell. Can't change anything. Don't be mad at these people. Maybe you did a shitty job. But I just can't. If I win, it feels like I'm going back there. Hey, tell me why I'm so good. I don't want any of those things. But I, I don't know if it's right for me to say to you, don't poll the jury. Don't go, do not go talk to the jury. It's just me. I, I'm on the side of, to be honest with you, Win or lose, you talk to the jury. If you lose, you're more likely to talk to the jury. If you win, maybe don't go. You, you learn from mistakes a hell of a lot more than from success. Hey, how well did I do? That's a, but a loss. Okay, what did I do wrong? You're going to take that three motions or three trials or the next trial down the road. And it's a tough nut to put in that mouth. Imagine taking a small piece of brick and biting down on it. That's how I feel about polling a jury that just said no to me, no to my client. Just go like this. With the, it should really bother you. But you got to grit through it and go listen to them, I think. Because there's wisdom there. Those people are a poll. You're polling the jury. It doesn't mean that when it said, but you are. What did I do wrong? Five said, your tie sucked. You know, four said, yeah, you were right about that, but I just can't let the guy get away with $25,000 in debt and just walk away. Well, you know what? You just did a shitty job because you didn't show them that, yes, he owes it. He just doesn't owe it to these people. So that's something you got to work on and then follow up with. And this is the worst I've had this happen. But I showed you how they didn't receive the assignment of the da 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 da. And they'll go, oh, really? I've actually questioned someone, not being mean, where they go, oh, I would have ruled for you then. You can't do anything about that. I mean, I repeated, rinsed, repeated, rinsed. This is why you play pickleball, so you can bang out the stress of a trial. It's not for the young, but it is for the bold. Um, 32, I think, when I did my first trial, and it gave me this gray hair. Turned gray the next day. No, I didn't. But I kept the gray eventually. Um, this, uh, if this was useful to you, not this, please subscribe or tell your friends, or I'll put the show notes on the um, collectionstopper.com podcast plus so you can see what I just said in an easier way. Maybe you can just conform it to your research. Uh, what else am I supposed to say? Oh, like, subscribe. Watch it again if you want to look at this. I'll do a 10-minute-ish video that's shorter and less kvetching and complaining and whining and crying. I won't cry in my 10-minute video. And uh, I hope this is helpful. Please if you want me to do anything, I'll do it for you for free. Um, I'm also going to do a class. I see a lot of YouTube and they go, hey, come and do our class. I know there's money involved in that. I'm not going to do that. If you want to call me up for 15 minutes on any topic, I'll give you my advice without my where your state is kind of advice. So I'll give you general advice. If you need, if you're banging your head against the wall, I see it all only by virtue of the gray hair and the 30 years. If you want that, I'll give it to you for free. I'll give you 15 minutes. So 
if you're an attorney, you're stuck and you're about to go to trial, remember that first trial, I would not have won that. I don't think without that older attorney just happened to be there. So let me be that older attorney for you so I can pass it along. Is it what they say? Pass it forward or move it forward? He did me a solid and I've kept what I'm saying to you today as far as the experts and winning. He didn't have to do that for me, but he did. So I'll do it for you. I'll give you 15 minutes of my free time. I don't want you to, I'm not asking you to subscribe and I'll give you 15 minutes. There's no quid pro quo. What is that? Uh, Silence of the Lamb? Quid pro quo, Clarice. Uh, as a movie reference. Just call me up or whatever you want and I'll help you. I don't want to email because I don't want to get into, hey, he gave me state advice that he's not in. Call me up. I'll give you very general advice for free for 15 minutes. Just don't abuse me and take 30 minutes. And I'll tell you why I'm doing that. I'll be very honest with you. I am going to create a class of help that helps people where I will charge. But I'm not doing that if I suck at it. So you'll do me a solid if you actually do me a solid if you ask for help and let me help you and then just tell me whether I sucked or what I could have done better. I guess I'm going to be polling the jury of one if you ask me advice and I help you. Okay, so subscribe, call for help, comment if you need help, because clearly I do, <laughs> and send the guys in the white coats and the big nets after me. Thank you very much for listening. I hope I wasn't too bothersome. <laughs>